Friends call me the man with the notebook. The book contains entries about road accidents and their causes. It would be a poor world where children never played. But circus tricks have their proper place, and that place is not a public road. I've got quite a lot of entries showing that games on roads lead to trouble. A lot also depends on the motorist. But the real thing is for both children and motorists to give one another a chance. And the motorist hadn't much chance on this occasion. This second shot shows what it looked like from the motorist's point of view. Four children are killed every day on our roads, but also a large number find themselves in hospital with fractured arms and legs and other injuries. Motorists might remember scenes like this when they next speed along the highway. There always will be some impulsive children who run unexpectedly onto the road, and parents might, with advantage, encourage their children to do their curb drill. Look right, look left, and then cross if it's all clear. And one does see children really making a royal progress across a road at a Belisha beacon with the traffic all waiting for them. It's not only children. Some grown-up people seem really to try and get run over. I stood in a small Yorkshire town not long ago and saw some apparently sane people step off the pavement without a thought for passing traffic. Grown-ups might do their curb drill as well as children. I call this the case of the open gate. If the gate had been closed, there'd have been no entry in my notebook. I was invited to little Jennifer's fourth birthday party. I noticed someone had given Jennifer a doll. She was delighted with it. It was pleasant on this warm summer afternoon having tea in their old world garden. Although adjacent to a busy main road, we nevertheless seemed isolated from the noise of the traffic. Jennifer was a perfect little hostess and performed her duties in a manner befitting the occasion. All her guests had to have two pieces of birthday cake, and as she was pouring out the tea, we all had to drink two cups. So far, the party had been a great success, but I wondered what had happened to her little brother. He was usually about when there were cakes to be had. He eventually arrived with Dizzy the Bull Terrier, complete the family. I'd have you know that Dizzy is his real name, not that he in any way resembles that great statesman. We were all pleased to see him and were rather amused at his mode of traveling under one small boy power. Dizzy loves the whole world, with one exception. He hates the feline species. him is like a red rag to a bull. Or 
off goes Dizzy, Helter Skelter, with Jennifer in full pursuit. For a moment or two, we couldn't help laughing, but suddenly we remembered the busy main road and dreadful possibilities present themselves to us. Her mother distractedly calls for Jennifer. He is not in sight, and not realizing her danger or the anguish of her mother, is hiding on the verge. But on hearing her mother's voice, she shows herself. We were all very thankful that she was safe, and I think even Jennifer realized that she might have been crushed and broken like the doll. Jennifer might be your little sister, your daughter, or your granddaughter. I put down in the notebook, more care by lorry driver passing the open gate, teach Jennifer not to run on road without looking, and finally close the gate. And then there was the case of Richard Shaw. I knew Richard Shaw fairly well. He was a retired tradesman, and I used to see him every day go over to the Rose and Crown to meet his friends. I think they almost set their watches by his arrival. He was so punctual. Hello, boys, was his usual greeting as he entered the Rose and Crown. And one glass of beer and the game of dominoes was the regular morning routine. And the same thing happened every day, wet or fine. His jovial personality seemed to create a pleasant atmosphere. They never wasted much time in conversation before getting on with their game, and I don't think they ever played for any stake, but Richard never allowed the pace to slacken on that account. The old gentleman won more often than he lost, it used to please us to watch him and his old cronies vying with one another. The landlord would rest for a moment to watch Richard bluffing and teasing them with his good-natured chaff. We used to watch that wriggly line develop to a climax. I didn't know his friends, but they seemed very decent old fellows, and when Richard beat them, as he often did, they showed no resentment and almost seemed to enjoy it. They looked forward to their morning game as much as Richard did. On this occasion, luck seemed to favor the old gentleman. He couldn't do anything wrong. The twinkle in his eye might have warned them that something was going to happen. And there was considerable merriment when he won his game with a double six. For Richard Shaw to be even a few minutes late was an event. When it ran on to being a quarter of an hour late, there was rather an air of apprehension. What had happened was that the old gentleman had started off serenely and travelled on the bus he took every morning. He was a polite man and rather made a point of things like giving up his seat to a lady. In fact, he was a delightful old gentleman. Like most elderly people, Richard suffered from twinges of rheumatism, and he was very grateful to the conductress for her timely assistance. Richard had been brought up in a generation where courtesy and service were taken for granted. His kindly nature endeared him to young and old, and he was extraordinarily popular wherever he went. 
Broadway is well known to Richard. Today, it's something good for the 2.30. Richard is definitely interested. He's no intention of putting his shirt on the horse, as Joe suggests. He might risk a bob. Joe's warning came too late. Poor old fellow, one moment enjoying his well-earned retirement, the next a broken and battered human being. So quick was the transition that one's mind recoils with the horror of it. Richard Shaw, the pleasant, likable, and sporting old gentleman, is typical of thousands of men in this country. He might be your father or your grandfather, and they all like Richard, run a risk when crossing the busy roads of today. If they fail to watch the traffic when they step out in front or behind a stationary vehicle, their fate may be like that of Richard Shaw. I wandered round this old cemetery recently. It was a peaceful spot, and when I met the cemetery superintendent, I asked him how many graves there were there. I worked out that it would take a cemetery about six times this size to accommodate the people killed on our roads in one year. such a waste of life. And there are also the seriously injured to remember. I see in my notebook that there are between 30 and 40,000 people really seriously injured every year on our roads. I think there are some things in my notebook worth remembering. 